Amen. Okay. Um, we're going to have the reading now. So we have Chris, Leslie, and Sarah. First Book of Kings, chapter 2. You'll need to find page 336. And as I'm reading a church Bible, I can't see it with my glasses on. So I'm going to start reading from chapter 2, verses 10 and 12, and then we're going on to chapter 3. So 1 Kings 2, verse 10. Then David rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. He had reigned for 40 years over Israel, seven years in Hebron, and 33 in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his rule was firmly established. Now if you'd like to turn over to chapter 3, beginning at verse 3 to verse 14, that's page 338. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the statutes of his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place, and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you, and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant a king in place of my father David, But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you've chosen, a great people, too numerous to count on number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never be anyone, there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for both riches and honour, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in my ways and obey my statutes and commands as your father David did, I will give you a long life. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is taken from Ephesians 5, page 1176 in the Church Bibles, and it's verses 15 to 20. Be very careful, then, how you live. But understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk from wine or debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, 
the three days. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you can eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. This is the word of the Lord. Hey, sorry, I was just expecting him to come. <laughs> Anyway, we're going to have Greg to come and speak to us now. Morning, everybody. Please keep your Bibles open at the Gospel reading of John. Uh, that's what we're going to be focusing on. Uh, but meanwhile, let's begin with prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the privilege of sharing in your word this morning. And we ask that in the ministry of the word, your word and the sermon this morning, that you will open our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears and our spiritual hearts and give us the grace to be able to see and to hear and to believe and receive everything that you have for us this morning through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> right, I said I'm going to be focusing on the gospel reading, but first of all, let's uh, look at the uh, earlier two readings. All three readings, incidentally, are pointing towards wisdom. Not as we understand it, but as God defines it. The first reading in uh, First Kings, uh, we see God visiting Solomon in a dream in the night. And in that dream, God gives him an open check. And he says, ask what I shall give you. And Solomon asks for understanding, an understanding mind to discern what is good and evil so that he can faithfully do God's work by God's people. He asks for wisdom, and God is very pleased that that's what he asks for, not something about himself, but something about God. So he put God first. In the second reading, Paul tells the Ephesians to walk in this same wisdom, that is to put God first. And he tells them to do that by remembering that they live in an evil world and to make the best use of the little time that they have on earth by finding what God's will is and doing that will. And in our gospel reading, it is the same wisdom of having God take first place in your life, in my life, that Christ is also pressing on his congregation. Now let's back up a little bit because uh, the portion we read is right about towards the end of a conversation that begins in John 
chapter 6, verse 22. And uh, let me just bring us up to date a little bit. The day before this conversation, Jesus had spent the whole day feeding, or rather, yeah, feeding the minds of the crowds that surrounded him with the word of God. He taught them from morning till evening. And at the end of the day, he multiplied five fishes, uh, five loaves of bread and two fishes to feed 5,000 people. There were 5,000 men. There were more. That was a huge miracle. Now, the next day, which is like this day in our reading, those same people want more bread and they want more fish. They want more food. So they go looking for him. And when they find him, they begin a conversation with him. We need to hear part of that conversation where it begins in John chapter 6, verse 25. So if you have your Bible open to the Gospel reading, uh, the Pew Bible, page uh, 1071, uh, 1070 rather, verse 25, I'll read. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? For they are looking for him for the wrong reason. Now hear what Christ says to them in the next verse, in verse 27. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. And then he cautions them in verse 27. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. Now they pick up on the word work. Do not work for this, but work for that. And they say to Christ, in verse 28, What must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus makes the most important statement in the whole of this portion of the chapter. And in verse 29, Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And they go on to ask him to prove himself all over again. He had just fed them the previous day uh, with five loaves of bread and two fishes multiplied. And they are basically saying to him, if we're going to believe you the way we believe Moses, then you've got to give us a sign the same way that Moses gave them a sign. He gave manna from heaven uh, to their ancestors. And it goes on and on, that conversation, until it gets to the portion that was read to us this morning. And so the portion we had is actually a continuation of this conversation. And in our reading, Christ, in fact, is coming towards the end of this conversation. Meanwhile, they have been grumbling and they have been disputing because they don't seem to like what Christ is saying to them. It's not what they want to hear. But Christ does not water down his teaching or whatever he says to them because it is for him, a matter of life and death. He wants them to have the whole truth so that they can make up their minds and make their choice, whether they will be with him and have life, or whether they will be without him and lose that life. It's pretty much like going to a doctor. I mean, if you, for those of you who use glasses, and I do, uh, you, you go to an optician, he checks you out. He's not going to give you uh, a diagnosis that is wrong simply to make you happy. If your eyes are very bad, he's going to say your eyes are in pretty bad condition. That way he can give you the right prescription. Otherwise, he can give you a diagnosis that makes you happy and gives you a prescription that also makes you happy. But the result is going to be uh, terrible. The person can even end up being blind. And so, rather than dumb down Christ actually presents this part of, the t of his teaching in the strongest possible terms. Now, if you read the whole of that chapter, you will find that this portion that you have read, read this morning is actually harsher than the preceding sections of the conversation. And that's what we're going to be looking at now in our, uh, our sermon. Firstly, uh, the three things that I think Christ is wanting the his people to hear, to receive in this portion. The first thing is this in verse 53, and I read verse 53, if you are there, please open. <clears throat> truly, truly, I say to you, unless 
you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those are pretty strong words. He's saying to them, you have to eat my flesh and you have to drink my blood to have life. He's using the metaphor of food, eating, drinking, referencing yesterday's feeding of 5,000, which they could easily relate to. But he's saying to them, manna is earthly food and it gives earthly life. And he says, I didn't come all the way from heaven to give you what I have already given to you. So don't follow me because of manna. I gave you that already. You don't have to sing for your lunch. You can have all the manna that you want, eat it all up, and still die. So he says, what you need is God's very life inside you. The word there translated as life in our reading is actually, actually means divine life, the life of God. It's not natural. Nobody is born with that kind of life. There is no human being on earth who comes to the world with that kind of life. The Greek have three words that they use for life. And the one that Christ consistently uses here is the one that refers to the life of God. Not the ordinary life that you and I have by eating and feeding and we stay stronger and we are alive. Not that. It's the life of God. And Christ Jesus is saying, that's what you need. The life of God is what you need inside you. And to get that life, you need to eat the bread that comes from heaven. And I am that bread. He's saying, in essence, focus on me, not on bread and fish that you ate yesterday and you're looking for more of that. Eat me, my flesh. Drink my blood. For the Jews, flesh and blood was an idiom. I mean, a way of saying the whole person. So Christ is saying, you need to accept me, the whole person that I am, not just bits and pieces, not the miracles that I, may, I do, not the signs and the wonders that you see. They accepted all of that, and they loved all of that, and they were following him you know, for all of that. They said, that's not what you need. You need to accept who I am. You need to form an intimate relationship with me. So to eat and to drink is to believe in Christ, to believe that his sacrifice gives you salvation. And so Christ says in that verse, unless you do this, you have no life. Now that word is very harsh, unless. Because it is a condition, it gives a condition. If you don't do this, you won't get that. If you want to get that, you must do this. Human beings, as many of you know, don't like conditions. Especially the 21st century variety of humanity. We want to have it always, every way. And so we typically want to be very inclusive, which is fine, as long as it takes account of the condition laid down by Christ. He says, if you eat and drink, you are included. If you do not eat and drink, you are excluded. So if you want to be included, you have to eat and drink. And unless you eat and drink, you are excluded. Pretty tough words. But those are his words. That is his teaching. And it will not help for us to try to water that down. Years ago, uh, I remember I drove to town, town center here, and uh, we were about to come back home. My little boy, very young at the time, I think he was still a toddler, maybe two or three years old. He took over the driver's seat. He wanted to drive. He's always loved cars. You know, put his hands on his steering, and he wanted to drive. And I said, let's go home. But he wouldn't get out of the seat. I said, well, unless you get out of that seat, and I come in, we can't go home. And he wouldn't come out of that seat. He stayed put, kept his hands on the steering, twisted the whole thing, and was sort of, you know, making all the noises, screaming, 
Dad, let's go home. I said, but you've got to get out of that place, and I've got to take over that seat, and then I'll drive. You can't drive. And that's how important it is. That's how ex exclusive it can be. I cannot include him in the driving. It's impossible. There is no equality there at all. He simply has to be where he needs to be, and I need to be where I need to be to fulfill the condition of driving that car back home safely with the two of us intact. And Christ is the driver. That's what he's saying. I came all the way from heaven. Not to give you bread and butter. You have that already. That was given to you long far from the beginning. I didn't come to do that. I came to do what no one else could do, what you couldn't do for yourself. Drive you back to heaven. And I must be in that driver's seat in your life if you are going to get there. And unless you let me get in that place, be in the driver's seat, we can't go anywhere. You have no life in you. Beloved, I ask at this stage, can we spare a thought for those who are full of the earthly manner, the wealth of this world, the food of this world, the pleasures, the comforts, but they do not have this life that Christ speaks about. Can we spare a thought for those who are full of the earthly manner and presume that they have this life that Christ speaks about, yet do not have it? And can we spare a thought to find out how we must reach them with this life that Christ speaks about. We have that obligation, and it's a very important one. And when we do have the opportunity to discharge that obligation, we must ensure that we teach what the Lord himself felt it was an absolute duty to teach that it is indispensable having Christ be the driver in your life. It's absolutely indispensable to having the life that God has. We cannot water that down. If we do, we are doing them a disservice and we will be like the doctor who gives a false diagnosis simply because he wants to please his patient. The second thing that I believe Christ is wanting to uh, share with these people is in verses 54 to 56. And I read, in the gospel reading, John 54, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. And he's saying, you have to go on feeding on my flesh, and you have to go on drinking my blood to continue to have that life. So you begin by eating and drinking. You have to continue doing that, feeding, continue doing that, drinking, to continue to have the life, the life of God in you. The translation there, although it says, he who feeds on me and drinks my blood, it's actually saying, he who continues to feed, those of you who are grammarians, it's present continuous. If you continue to feed, and you continue to drink, so it's not in the past, it's a continuous thing, it's ongoing. If you continue to feed on me, you continue to drink my blood, then you're going to continue to have that life. The first one is if you eat and drink. That's the starting point. But he continues. So he's saying it's a journey. Our sister mentioned that this morning. It's a journey. Being in Christ is a journey. It's not the day you give your life and then it's all over, except for the thief on the cross. That was the only one who had that privilege. And we are not in that place. Otherwise, Coming to Christ is the beginning of the journey. We step in. 
at that place. And the goal is the last day. Several times in that portion, Christ says, I will raise him up on the last day. So there is a need to abide, to stay for the long haul. It's not a badge you pin on your chest and walk away and do as you please and as you like. I listened to one celebrity a couple of years ago on TV and says, oh, all you need to do is come to Christ. Everybody come to Christ, you know, come to Jesus. Say, I believe in Jesus. I love Jesus. And then just go and do your own thing. That's what he said. But that's not what Christ is saying. And we cannot give any hope that what that guy, the way he understands Christ is the correct way. It's wrong. Christ is saying, you have to step in. You have to continue to feed. You cannot go back and do your own thing. That simply means Christ is not in the driver's seat in that person's life. If he can go back and do his own thing. It's pretty much like a marriage. You take the vows, you stay with the spouse. That's what marriage means. That's what Christ is saying. You've come, you feed, you drink, keep doing it. We have a relationship. Don't go away. Stay if you want to continue to have that life. And finally, the third thing that I believe that the Lord is saying to this congregation in Capernaum, in a synagogue, uh, which was their church at the time, in verses 57 to 58, he says, As a living father sent me, and I live because of the father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This, pointing to himself at that stage, is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. So he's saying there, you have to continue this feeding on my flesh and drinking of my blood to the very end, to live forever. So first of all, he says, you have to eat my flesh, drink my blood to have life in you, the life of God. Secondly, you have to go on feeding on my flesh and drinking my blood to continue to have that life of God in you. And thirdly, he says, you have to continue this feeding on my flesh and this drinking of my blood to the very end. Whatever the end of that person's life is, to live forever. In each of these case, cases, there is a condition. And it's laid down by the Lord himself. And Christ, in this last point, has the future, of course, in mind. He's saying whoever does that, he also will live. He will live forever. And as many of you know, and I know this from experience personally too, finishing is a real challenge in many projects. It's pretty easy to start in many cases, but to finish can be difficult. And Christ is saying to complete the journey, you need to abide. And in order to abide, you need to continue feeding and drinking. That's a picture of how we grow spiritually. To the point we have the maturity to stay the course, we have the strength to hold on, and we have the courage to keep on walking with him. Now, the, the key word in all of this is believing, eating, drinking. But believing, that's the word. If you take it out from the metaphor, that's what he's saying. And believing is an action that goes on and on and on continuously. Believing in Christ means, one, you have had a change of ownership. You and I. That's what it means. I think the, the, the place in scripture that puts it much more, uh, most graphically is uh, Colossians 1.13, where he says, we have been delivered from the kingdom of Satan and transferred to the kingdom of his dear son. There is a relocation, a physical movement, even though we are still here on earth. A change of ownership from Satan to God, to Jesus. That's what it means to be born again. That's what it means to come to trust in Christ. 
Nobody comes into the world born into salvation. But we have a second birth. And that's what Christ is saying. That's believing. You have had a change of ownership. It means that you are in full agreement with all that Christ stands for. And that your whole life is completely at his disposal. It means to have Christ completely take over your whole life in the same way that a master owns a slave. And this is why Paul tells the disciples in Corinth, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. If you buy something, it belongs to you. Second birth, coming to Christ, means that Christ is paying for us, he's buying us from the hands of Satan. We belong to him. We are no longer our own. And this is why Paul also tells the Romans to present their bodies as a living sacrifice to the Lord. And that is what it means precisely to be holy. That we are set apart exclusively for God's use. For those of you who are much older in the church, that's the word, what we used to call sanctification. Set apart completely for God's use. In the same way, perhaps at that table, you won't use it for anything else. It's for communion. It's sanctified to God. And that makes the table holy because it belongs to God. And that's what, what it means for us to be, to, to be in Christ. Set apart completely for Christ. Uh, and it is this holiness, this setting apart, that Christ wants to show in our daily living. He wants those who follow him to be so empty of themselves that he can fill them with himself and so that he can make their daily lives a showcase of what he stands for. It means saying what he says in practical terms. It means doing what he does. It means walking how he walks. It means standing where he stands. I don't know if uh, you were watching during the worship when we were singing and uh, Steve, I don't know what your, your daughter's name, but Ellen, you saw her go up to the father. Did you notice that? And she just took her place by him and stood there. I was watching. I was wondering, what's she going to do there now? Is she going to take the guitar from him and begin to strum away at it? No. She just stood there. And at some point she was yawning. Lovely. But the dad kept doing what he was doing. For me, that was a perfect picture of how Christ wants us to be. Just take our stand with him and leave him to do all the work. We may get tired sometimes. We can yawn. That's fine. But take your stand by him anyway and allow him to keep doing the work. Because if you are standing by him, taking your stand with him, standing where he stands, you are safe. I doubt anything could ever happen to her all the while she was standing there with you. Nothing. Impossible. That's what it all means. And that's why God has given us his word, the Bible. And this is very crucial. That we may find what his mind is and where he stands. So that we also may have the same mind and stand exactly where he stands. That's the wisdom he wants us to have. That's why he gives us the word. For example... To be owned by Christ and to follow in the wisdom that he has given us in his word would mean that we stand where he stands on salvation. You want to preach salvation? You can't preach anything other than the way he has preached it. You give him, give him that. That without Christ, you have no life. That's what he said, and that's where it ends. Anything else is either adding to it or taking away from it. We are not standing with him if we do that. We need to stand, for example, where he stands 
on the wall. It says, if you love the world, you are my enemy. That's what Christ teaches. Now, that's not something we speak about too often these days from our pulpits. The world. It's our enemy. And God says, he who is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. There is a condition there. If you're going to be a friend of God, you must be an enemy of the world. You cannot love the world. You cannot walk in the ways of the world. You cannot follow the world views, the philosophies of the world. You can't. And you need to stand where he stands on morals, general morals, sexual morals, what, where, what is, where he stands on dating, where he stands on marriage, where he stands on business, how you conduct your business, your career, and all of that. You must find out in his word exactly where he stands, what his mind is, and then you stand there. That's what it means. So it is our wisdom to know the word of God as thoroughly, as thoroughly as we possibly can. I mean, a lot of us have a, do a lot of reading all the time. We read in newspapers. We read a lot of stuff online. We read novels and all of that, but can hardly find the time for our scriptures. But how are we going to have the wisdom that he wants us to have if we don't find the time to read that very word? We need to find a way to cultivate personal studying of the word. I mean, when we come here together, we study the word, but on your own, on a daily basis, it's helpful to open the scriptures. I know I said this the last time I was here, it takes only 90 hours to read the Bible from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22. Just 90 hours. So if you were to set aside an hour a day, you would have gone through the scriptures in three months. Now you could do 15 minutes a day and that's fine. 10 minutes a day, that's fine. But you need, as a child of God, to cultivate a personal, regular, daily reading of his word for your own study, for your own life. And this is exactly what Paul is saying to the Ephesians in the reading we had, that they should be filled with the Holy Spirit to encourage one another in Psalms. How will they be able to do that if they don't have it in them? And how will they have it in them if they have not read the Psalms? Encourage one another in the Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And as many of you know, that's one way that we take in and remember the Word of God. When we sing, we are singing our theology. When we sing, we are singing the Scriptures. If you can't remember the verses, you remember the songs. And when you sing, you are actually taking your stand with God. And so Paul says to the Ephesians, you need to do that on a regular basis because you live in evil times and your wisdom will be to know the word of God, to know the will of God so that you can make the best use of the little time that you have here by living in accordance with the will of God. So Christ basically is saying, unless you believe in me, you cannot be saved. Unless you go on believing in me, you cannot abide in me. And unless you go on abiding in me, you can't live forever. Beloved, the people whom Christ spoke to in our reading 2,000 years ago in the synagogue in Capernaum, they were all his followers, most of them. It's difficult to believe that, but they were his followers. And the Bible actually calls them disciples. They had spent the whole of the previous day listening to his teaching. And they had partaken of the glorious miracle of the multiplication of five loaves and two fishes. And the next day, they had gone out looking for him. In that crowd, there were disciples who wanted more fish, more bread, and they wanted to make Christ the king. The previous day, they had wanted to do that, and he ran away to make him king so that he can guarantee a regular supply of that bread and fish. In, a, in, in, in short, they wanted 
an earthly paradise right here, right now. There were many of them, probably in the majority by a landslide. In that same crowd, there were other disciples who were prepared to wait the long haul. There were few, probably very few. And that may remind us of what Christ said to his people about the broad way and the narrow way. Jesus isn't necessarily looking for numbers, but he's looking for commitment. And that's important. Now, all those people to whom he spoke 2,000 years ago are dead and gone. Those who ate his flesh and drank his blood and kept on feeding and drinking till the very end have gone on to receive the gift of life forever, which he promised. On the other hand, those who didn't eat his flesh and drink his blood, they have lost that gift forever. So this is no longer about them, but about you and I. And if I may ask a few questions before I close this morning, not to condemn or criticize, but to help us examine our lives. First, where are you standing this morning? Who is the controlling influence in your life? Who is in the driving seat? Have you eaten the flesh of Christ and drank his blood? Do you accept his full ownership of your life? Are you in full agreement with all that he stands for? And is your whole life completely laid out at his disposal to do with as he pleases? Are you personally studying the word the Bible for yourself. And finally, are you standing with Christ this morning in every area of your life? In your dating, if you are dating, in your marriage, if you're married, in your business, if you're a businessman or woman, in your career, if you're a career person, and in your relationship with the world. I want to close with a prayer. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't gone this relationship that Christ is talking about, this is a sober moment to make a start. And I will ask you to pray specifically, quietly where you are. So I'm going to give a few moments of silence to do that. And if you have any difficulty praying that prayer, then I'll suggest that at the end of the service you ask one of the leaders uh, to help you. I might be able to help you as well. And if you uh, have known the Lord, you've met the Lord, you've fed on him, you are his disciple, you're a child of God, you're a believer, but you are struggling. And in the light of the work this morning, you know that you are not really standing fully where you ought to be standing with Christ. You're making compromises here and there. I want to ask you to pray specifically to ask God's help. So I give you a few moments of silence to do that before I close.
Heavenly Father, I ask that you give every one of us the grace to love you to the point where we are able to completely release our lives into your hands, completely empty ourselves of ourselves, and allow you to be the controlling influence in our lives, and have the grace to be able to say what you say, stand where you stand, walk how you walk that we may please you as faithful disciples, even if the whole world hates us for doing that. May your grace abound in each life, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.